register online at madisonfbc.org just so that we're able to actually know how many are coming because it's actually going to be catered this year. So we just want to encourage you to do that. And as we continue um, to worship this morning, how can we be praying together? So do you have a prayer request or a praise? If you're at home, please feel free to use the comment section to share that. But if you're here in the room with us this morning, please feel free to shout out your prayer requests or praise this morning. We have a family member who's having a it's double, a friend, a friend of family, <laughs> having a double mastectomy. Yeah, and they're afraid it's going to be pretty long. Okay. Pray for her this week. And pray for Stephanie as well. Okay. Uh, my wife, Lisa, better than So Lisa's not feeling well today. Rebecca got married yesterday and is heading off for her honeymoon soon. Anyone else? Will you join me in prayer? God, we come to you knowing that you are the creator of this world, that you are with us and present, and that we have the ability to come together this morning to praise and to worship you. And as we do that this morning, Lord, we pray that we would lay the things that are our struggles, that are concerns at your feet and trust you to handle them in your way. And we also ask that those things that we're excited about and celebrating, that we would turn back into praise for you this morning. So Lord, would you lead us deeper into worship together as a community this morning? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, Frank, let's all stand together. As we worship this morning, we are few in number up here on the stage, but uh, let's make our worship all the, the louder. How's that sound? The storm rises from the deep. And rages around me, but I will remember when doubt wars within my heart, the battle almost lost, I will remember. You have the last word. The calm, the violent sea speaks courage over me, so I will remember the words awake the sun to rise are breaking through my night, and I will remember you have the last word.
overcomes the enemy in you. We are more than conquerors. Your word stands through the ages. Your voice shatters the darkness in you. We are more than conquerors. You speak in strongholds, surrender. Your name overcomes the enemy in you. believe that this morning? Amen. I am not skilled to understand what God has willed, what God has planned. I only know at His right hand stands one who is my savior i take him at his word and deed christ died to save me this i read and in my heart i find a need for him to be my savior on high and come for sinful man to die you count it strange so once did I for him to be my savior my savior loves my savior lives my savior's always there for me my God he was my God he is my God he gonna be yes living dying let me breathe my strength my solace from this spring that he who lives to be my king once died to be my savior that he will leave his place on
my portion, I shall not want. The Lord my comfort, I shall not fear. Yea, though I walk through the valley low, yea, though the path gets deep, surely I stand secure, the Lord my healer, your love endures, yea, though I walk through the valley low, yea, though the path gets deep, surely Father, we come to you at this time and we just uh, lift up any offering that might be taking place online or anyone who chooses at this point or later on in the service to give. Lord, we lift that up to you, Father, just as a sacrifice of praise to you. Again, Lord, knowing that everything we have comes from you, help us not to take credit for the things that we have done, Lord. Help us not to say, oh, I did this, look at me, but instead always turn our gaze back upon you the one who loves us, the one who cares us and supplies all of our needs according to your riches and glory, Lord. And we'll be careful to give you praise for all that you've done. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior.
perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture. with us now and this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day Thank you, Lord, for being our Savior. God, teach us what that means. Teach us how to worship you. Teach us who you are so that when we worship, we're worshiping you, not some image that we create in our own minds. So God, as we turn our lives over to you every day, we just thank you for showing us the way. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. So I'd love to share with you from Exodus this morning, second book of the Bible. And this is an incredible story. And as, as I read through, as I reread through these passages and these chapters in preparation, I was reminded of things and also learned some new things. Um, just a background, remember Moses was called by God to lead the Israelite people, the Hebrew people, out of bondage and slavery in Egypt and lead them back to their, their ancestral place, to the, the land of milk and honey. And as they went on this journey, God did amazing miracles, showing them who God really is. Amazing story. So read back through Exodus, just amazing encounters. And as they're traveling as a group of people, for example, God was with them as a pillar of fire at night and as a cloud by day and crossed the Red Sea, the waters parted. And then as they're traveling through the desert, God provided them food and water um, as needed and what they needed to survive. And then they get to a point, they're at the foot of Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai is an amazing mountain. Um, God is known to encounter people on this mountain. And as they arrive, God calls Moses to come up. God wants to have a conversation. And one of the things I recognize in, in reading and researching this, do you know how many times Moses went back and forth up the mountain during this time period while they're camped out there? Seven times. And so there Moses is um, traveling back and forth Someone this morning mentioned to me, you know, the biggest miracle of that, as old as he was, he didn't have a heart attack going up and down that mountain. <laughs> but as 
God encountered him this first time as Moses went up. God made a proposal. And you know, proposals are amazing things. Now proposals, wedding proposals, you know, are a big deal. You, if, if you do one now, you need to have it recorded, photographs and video so that people can see it. And there's a lot of pressure on someone who's proposing because they know it's going to be plastered everywhere. Poor Lisa just had me asking, opening a, a ring and, and taking it to her favorite spot and saying, will you marry me? So it wasn't, I don't know, very um, wor worthy of a videographer. But it, it meant something, and it stuck so far, so that's good. So that's what counts. Um, but God made a proposal through Moses to all of the Israelite people and said, I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people. And what that means is I want you to be a nation of priests. Do you know what priests are during that time period? Priests are the people who represented God to the people. And he didn't just say, I want a few priests. I want a nation of priests. And what God is implying is that the Israelite people are supposed to let the world know who God is. And God was going to use them to make it happen. And as part of that, it required commitment. And so God explained this to Moses, and they, God decides, I'm going to present this directly. And so God, in a thunderous way, talks to the people, and he gives them the Ten Commandments and verbally tells them this. And as they're listening to this, God then withdraws, and the people say to Moses, and this is important. I, I, I didn't recognize this as many times as I have read this. But the people say, well, we might do that, but don't have God do that again. That was too much. It was scary. God's presence was scary. And it was frightening to have God bellow all these things out from the mountain. And could you just talk to God and relay to us the message, it'll be a lot more simple and less scary. And that's what happens. So then um, they get together and they have a discussion with Moses, the leadership, and say, we agree. We accept God's proposal. And so then in chapter 24, so the, the um, Ten Commandments and when God is bellowing that out, that is Acts, or um, Exodus 20. And 24 is when then Moses goes back up the mountain again and says, we accept your proposal. You can be our God. We'll be your people. And then God is like, awesome. Well, this is what I want. And so the next many eight chapters, God is explaining to Moses what this means. And he explains about the whole tabernacle because God says, I'm going to be have a visual presence with you wherever you go. And he explains how to make this giant tent and this giant fence and all these worship items within it in great detail. And this is part of the covenant. And so Moses is getting all this down. And then it takes a long time. So it's 40 days is Moses getting all this information from God about what is expected of the people. Meanwhile, and realize they're engaged now, okay? They're connected and they're engaged. They've agreed to this commitment. And the people are getting restless already. Even though they've experienced incredible miracles from God, they're getting restless and they're getting bored. Um, they're camping at the foot of the mountain and they're bored and this is getting old and they don't have anything to do. So then they go to Aaron. Now as a reminder, Aaron is Moses' brother. And back even to the time of the burning bush when God's telling Moses what instructions and what God wants Moses to do, Moses in this conversation with God says like, can my brother help? I, I can't talk very well and he's a lot better with words than I am. So can he be my mouthpiece? And like God's sure. So Moses is, has the right hand man of his brother Aaron. But as we see here, Mo, or Aaron's character isn't as strong as what Moses' is. So the people are grumbling to Aaron, and that's where we're at now, here in Exodus 32. Fascinating chapter. 
And in this chapter, remember, they're restless. They're at the foot of the mountain. Moses has been gone for 40 days. Um, and they're wondering what's up. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses. Even the way they're talk, referring to Moses now is looking down their nose at him. Who brought us here from the land of Egypt. And Aaron was lacking some strength here. And he said, okay, take the gold rings. Okay, so when they left Egypt, the Egyptians were so glad to see them go because of all the plagues. They were giving them their gold and their jewelry and such. So they had a lot. So Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters. And notice that during the culture this time period, the boys wear rings as well, as well as the girls. So I just find that interesting. And so bring them to me. And all the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. And then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. And when the people saw it, they exclaimed, Oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. This is incredible. The people are not following Yahweh anymore. They're wanting something they can see. Remember, God on the mountain, remember that was just a few chapters back? That was, God was too big. God was too powerful. God was mountainous. They want something more tame. They want a domesticated God that they can easily package and put in a box and be who they want God to be. Not that big, scary God who's the creator of the universe. And then I think it's so curious is their leader at this point is Aaron. And Aaron then does what they want. They wanted something, and he knows it's wrong, as we can see in a second, but he's willing to do what the people are asking him to do to keep them happy. I don't know if he's afraid of losing control while Moses is gone and he doesn't want a major rebellion on his hand, so he feeds into what they're saying, and he builds a calf for them to worship. And Aaron, in five, saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf. And then he announced, tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. Okay, so he builds a golden calf to worship, but then he's recognizing and he knows this is wrong, and he sees the people excited, so now he's trying to bring it back to God, Yahweh. And here in the passage, in, in your Bibles, it's Lord is capital, all capitals, L-O-R-D. That means Yahweh. He's using the holy name of God. So he's got a clear picture in his mind that this is Yahweh that he's leading them to worship, but it's at an altar at the foot of a golden calf. A lot of confusion is going on here. You know, major confusion in all their minds. Aaron's confused as who he needs to be as a leader because he really knows what's right and what's wrong, but he's doing what the people want, which is wrong. And then the people are allowing their influences from their culture living in Egypt where they have these idols, they're bringing that cultural mindset with them. And it's hard for them to separate what they learned from the Egyptians about who God is in that culture and to learn this new understanding for them, which really isn't new at all, but to understand the true image of who the awesome creator God, Yahweh, the creator of the universe, is. And they're struggling with that. And Aaron's trying to bring them back. In verse 6, the people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. And then I'm wondering, who are they doing that to? In Aaron's mind, he's trying to bring them back to worshiping Yahweh, even though he made a golden calf, which was stupid. But what's in the people's mind? So they're coming to worship at this festival and after this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. And the, the Hebrew word for that involves lots of physical touching. So whatever that was, it doesn't sound good at this moment as they're partying at the foot of the mountain while they're engaged to God. Okay, so they're, they're cheating on God already during the engagement. doesn't bode well for their future on their part. Do we do that? 
as I look at this and I'm thinking, how stupid can you be, people? You have just seen all of this majesty that God has done. He's, he's done all these miracles for you, sustaining you with these gobs of people leading them across the desert. What are you thinking? And then the Holy Spirit speaks to me when I'm thinking that, and it's like, Randy, isn't that you? Isn't that what you do? You don't always have a clear image of who I am, and you go against me sometimes and against my character and my nature because you start reconfiguring who you think God is in your mind. Is that different than them? Is that so different? And I'm like, yeah, I understand. So as much as I want to point fingers at their stupidity, I have to point those same fingers back at me and my own stupidity. And the truth is that we all do that. In fact, I just saw a, um, yesterday, uh, as I was looking at some things online, it was, a study was done that said one-third of practicing Christians who consider themselves evangelicals, which that 30% of them do not think that Jesus is a deity. Yeah. And I'm like, what are they thinking? And then there was a, a scientific study done over a decade ago by people out of um, Princeton Seminary. And they did a study interviewing, it's a very exhaustive study, looking at people's understanding of who God is in the United States. And what they found is that people had made their own golden calf. The vast majority of us, is what they said, had made our own golden calf. Because what they said that people have done is they've forgotten about the God that's presented in Scripture and have created their own God. One that's tame, one that's controllable, and one that does what we tell God to do, not the God of the universe. And there are three points, and these three points are the wrong things to think. So make that clarifying. Usually preachers do three points and that's what you're supposed to believe. These are the three wrong points. Okay, so this is what the research found. And this is among church people as well as general population. So one is that God wants you, the, the, the imaginary God, the golden calf God, God wants you to be moral. That is, God wants your good deeds that you do to outweigh your bad deeds that you do. And as long as your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you're okay. And that God just wants you to do the best that you can and to be moral, be nice to people, and then God's good. How is that wrong? Because God calls us to a higher standard than that. God calls us to be holy. God calls us to be his mouth and, and feet and, and words in this broken world. And we can't be above average because that's all that it's wanting is our morality to be above average. God calls us to be a holy and separate people. Jesus points this out when he uses the phrases like, you've heard it said, don't murder. I say, don't be angry with your brother or sister. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I say, don't lust. Jesus calls us to a heart cleansing, not just our outward actions that we do. So God calls us to a very high standard. It's above just your morality, making sure your good deeds outweigh your bad be deeds. So that's one. The second one of this wrong understanding of God that's this golden calf is that God wants you happy. God wants you happy, and that's God's job is to make you happy. And if you're not happy, God's not doing his job. And so this turns out like when we're looking at whenever we hit rough spots in the road that we, we ask God to fix it because we're not happy, things aren't going our way, then that's when we call out to God. Biblically, that is nowhere in God's word that God exists to make you happy. You exist to be in a special relationship with God to be a priest, a priest, a missionary for the world out there, and you may have to be involved in things that aren't pleasant. You may be called to do things that are very work-oriented, very arduous, very tough to do, and you may live, be living in horrible circumstances. Not saying that you're not called to have joy, 
and understanding that connection with God. But you may be in circumstances that are uncomfortable. When you look at Christians around the globe, um, we're blessed in our country that very often we don't have to deal with this, but Christians in other parts of the world are really suffering. China's really cracking down on Christians now. They're making internment camps. If you're any religion, they're doing it with Muslims too, but they made internment camps to put people in to help unlearn religion out of their lives. And then once you reach a certain state and agree to certain things, then you can go back home. But in northern China, there's large concentration camps that they've developed or internment camps to do that. In um, Eastern Bloc countries, in, in parts of Russia, other places, people are really suffering for their faith. And they're crying out to God like the Egyptians are. And God wants them to be holy, more than moral, and God understands they're not happy in their circumstances, but they can have joy. There's one story of a pastor who was captured. And as he was captured because of preaching the, the good news, and he was put into a prison. And as he was in prison, he would sing um, worship songs to God. And the other prisoners were making fun of him. And then they kept wanting this pastor to retract his faith and deny it, and he never would. And then after there was, I forget the period of time, but it was like a year this was going on. And finally they decided that they were going to kill the pastor. And so they get him out of jail, and they're walking out of his cell, and they're walking him. And as they're walking, and all prisoners all know what's going to happen, the prisoners all start singing the worship songs that he was singing and that they were making fun of him. And it wound up as the prison officials discussed what was going on, they thought it would be better to put the pastor back in jail. And he avoided execution because they understood that something was going on there that was bigger than them. God may call us to very difficult circumstances, may cause us to take risk. God may cause or call us to give up money, may cause us to give up things. In my home church, I remember there was a couple that I respected and they felt called to be missionaries. And they're wondering, and they had a farm, they sold their farm. And as they pursued what God was calling them to do. And it didn't end a happy story as they brought tons of people to Christ. They were missionaries for several years. The organization they went with um, stopped functioning and they wound up coming home and with no farm. And they were starting from scratch again. And they were praising Jesus. And I learned from that that sometimes we can be following what God is calling us to do, but that doesn't necessarily make you successful in the world's eyes, but they were successful in God's eyes as they were pursuing what God was doing. So God doesn't exist just to make us happy. He calls us to something much higher than that. Now, the third thing that is the false golden calf um, is that God is distance. God is distant from us. God is not with us all the time. And it's, it's more convenient. Just like the Hebrew people, when Moses um, and, and God, were, God was thundering and telling the Ten Commandments and part of the covenant, and that was too scary, they wanted God back up on the mountain and being quiet and just talking to Moses. That's exactly what the people today with the golden calf idea is they want God distant as well. They don't want God here all the time. What the research found is that the people want God only in their lives when they're not happy and when they need something. So when they need something, then they want God to come down from way out there and come down face to face and then pray and then talk to God about what we need. And then when they're done, then God can go back up on the mountain again. So it's very much where with this modern golden calf idea is that God does what the people say. And that, that we're, we're, as long as we're moral, then we can call on God and he'll make us happy. Now what the research found is that vast numbers of people believe this, but not for long. They found that after a person is living life for a while, that as they experience real life and bad things happen, then they recognize God's not very good at making me happy. Rough things happen, and things happen in life that we don't like. Therefore, the majority of the time, because the image is so of, benign, of God is so benign, so weak, so domesticated, then the next thought process is that instead of changing the idea of who God is to something more accurate of who God is, 
they just dismiss God and say, God must not exist because God's not doing what God's supposed to do. I'm not happy. I've got problems. Things, life stinks sometimes. And so then they just shove God out the door and forget God. So when it comes to us, I want us to really think and for myself to think, am I creating a golden calf that's safe and domesticated to worship? Now, these people had experienced God in real ways for a long period of time as they've left Egypt and as they've been traveling through the wilderness. You've been seeing God as well, working in a lot of different ways around you and in your past. You've seen God working. But that doesn't mean that you're worshiping a true image of who God really is. You could be worshiping a golden calf and not even know it because you're so used to it. I can be doing that because I'm so used to seeing God in, in the own image that I created that I've forgotten who the true God is. It's so easy to do that. So my challenge for all of this morning is to take a step back and to think about this. Am I worshiping the real God? Or am I worshiping a golden calf that I've allowed the culture to teach me who God is? Remember, just as the, the Egyptians taught the Israelites who God is falsely with all these other little gods, every time we listen to media, we turn on the TV, listen to music, we're being trained who the golden calf is. And it's so easy to confuse those things. So here's what, one way I want you to start thinking about things. One is listen to your own prayers. What are you praying? Are you praying like a, a, a to-do list for God to do for you? Are you praying, God, I need this, and I need this, and I need this? And my friends over here, they need this, and they need this, and they need this going on in their lives. If so, you might be worshiping a golden calf if, that, if that's all you pray. You see, the conversations that we have with God, the conversations we have with people inform us who, what we think about that person. You know, if we have a friend who's a really good listener, we may go to that friend and, and share a heart with them. And as we share a heart and they respond well, then that tells us that we think this person is a good listener. And it's good to recognize that. And if you have something going on, you know who to go to. Um, but your prayers are the same way. As you pray, they inform you what you think about God. So if you're not praising God about God and God's majesty and glory as the creator of the universe and to bring your salvation to us, then your God's too small. Think about what you're praying. Are you comfortable with your own morality? Do you see yourself making mistakes and doing sin, but do you excuse that in your own life because you do good things too? And you think that you do more good things than you do bad things, so you think that you're okay? That's the golden calf. That's not what God calls us to be. God calls us to be holy, set apart, separate. So examine your prayers. Now, how do we get to know the real God? Because it's easy to learn who our golden calf is because that just is automatic in our culture and around us teaching that. But how do we know who the real living God true God is. Scripture is what informs us to who that God is, the God who's not tame, the God who is incredibly powerful, the God who is scary sometimes. And the amazing thing about Scripture, like we're blessed now that we can have Scripture in something that we can hold and carry around with us and or even be, you know, on our, our iPhone. We can have our availability to Scripture is so there we can at any time we can read it ourselves but you know when scripture was created as this was being put together this was intended to be read in community it was intended to be read as people gather because you couldn't afford you couldn't take the bible home with you because it would be shelves and shelves of, of scrolls and so people gathered together to read scripture to memorize scripture and so scripture was a community event and people in groups discussed what it meant and how to apply it to our lives. And so 
it's awesome and we need to be reading scripture by ourselves because we have that great opportunity but it's just as important or even more important to be reading scripture in community in groups as we live life together and we discuss it and share our thoughts and feelings on it and how this impacts who we are and what we're doing and so this morning I want to challenge you are you reading scripture in community are you reading scripture with a group of people where you can come together and talk about it and apply it to your lives as a group and many of you are and many of you I don't know if you are or not so I want to challenge you and also tell you there's opportunity we're doing our best to create opportunity for you to connect with others in community focusing on the scriptures and we call them connection groups and we have different kinds we've got Sunday morning connection groups and those include Jerry Dugan has a Sunday school class called the seekers and they meet in the basement and then Grover is teaching Grover Anderson's teaching a class two doors down here on the left and they meet every Sunday morning and they study this together and it's incredible opportunity to grow and to learn from each other we also have connection groups that meet midweek and we have some that are starting new so for example on Monday nights starting on the 19th the whites will be hosting at their house and so you can go there and connect in community and then Tuesday night Eric is going to be leading here at church connection group and you're welcome to join that and then I will be continuing to teach Wednesday night and I'll be doing that at the church as well so that's Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night are opportunities for you to connect with Scripture in community together. And a goal is, is for us not to be worshiping our own golden calf, calf, but to understand who the real God of the universe is. Now we have other groups going as well. So I'm teaching currently on Sunday nights, but we're not labeling that a connection group because it's not going to have the same function as the others. So I'll be going through, starting November 1st, the Old Testament, and I'm going to be using a, a video curriculum that is college-level understanding of the Old Testament. And it's going to be very um, detailed as we go. Where did the Bible come from? Where did the Old Testament come from? The Hebrew Scriptures, how they get put together. And it's going to be... A great study but it'll be more like a class so it won't be a connection group um, the connection groups are people who are going to be sharing life together um, and seekers for example a Sunday school class has been doing that for years I think they've met 1800 times or more than that um, Jerry keeps track on his board of how many times they've met but they do send cards to each other and they're responsible to each other as a group of people if someone's not there they check up on them um, it's a really important way to do a connection group together um, so Sunday night my class won't do that intentionally it may happen naturally but it won't be intentional so it's an Old Testament survey class so it'll be a little bit more like you're going to a class to learn and then Stephanie is teaching and currently is and still will be on Thursday night teaching on the book of Revelation and that is happening and still going in the same way that is a class that you would attend and go to and I want to encourage you, though, to be in a connection group as well as attending those classes. Um, but there's lots of options for you to connect with Scripture and connect with each other and connect with God. And I know it is so difficult to change our schedules, but I really want to just challenge you to consider making time in your week to join a connection group if you're not already in one. And for some of you, Sunday morning would be a very appropriate time for you. Um, you're in worship service anyway, and so that would be a great time for you to, to do that. And we have incredible teachers. And then Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night are also great times. Um, if you want to, maybe you don't know the whites that well, and they're 
still this new feeling, even though we've only been here a year and a half. Um, but you want to connect with them more, this is an opportunity. You can get to know the whites. And maybe you, you hear Eric and you see him lead up here with music and occasionally share some biblical insight with you and you, you're interested in more of that. Um, Tuesday night, look at your schedule and see if that works for you and do that. Wednesday night, you hear me on Sunday morning. I won't get a, a, a bit feel bad if you're doing not my group because you get to hear me already but i'm meeting wednesday nights and it'll be always virtual as well and so it'll be virtually you can connect with that as as well and the other groups will decide for themselves if they want to be virtual or not but i just really want to challenge you to think about that because you need to be connecting with scripture with god's word to make sure you're not worshiping a golden calf by mistake because for many of us and let, let's be real because we're human beings the image that we have of god i don't think is ever perfect because of our limited finite minds and god is so big and so powerful so if you think you've got a good grasp of who god is i probably would doubt you um, because learning who god is for me is a lifetime process of learning this and learning god's character and nature and who god is and i need to be studying in groups to teach me and inform me and i think you do too so if you're not connecting with a group now here's great opportunity to do that and this isn't a, a permanent commitment um, but i want to challenge you as strongly as i can to consider being part of a connection group and if it doesn't work perfectly for you that's fine you'll have opportunity to switch and do something else and all the teachers won't mind they understand there's different fits and different groups will have their own personalities and that's good and that's fine so consider it now how do you connect with these on our webpage madisonfbc.org you can go to that and click on our connection groups and see when they are and what they are and sign up for them. And then the way this will work starting next week, the connection groups will be following the same themes that happen Sunday morning and be expounding on those and allow discussion of what is presented Sunday morning. And then the non-connection groups will be doing their own thing. So I'll be doing my own thing Sunday night. Stephanie will be doing her own thing Thursday night. So just clarifying on how that works. And the reason is, is for at least seasons, I want all of us to be studying the same thing together so we're growing in the same direction. And this season, um, as we approach um, Christmas, we'll be studying the Old Testament because that's the foundation of the New Testament. And it's, you can understand Christ's teachings better if you have an understanding of the Hebrew scriptures. Does that make sense? I'm challenging as hard as I can to get plugged in, and I know you've got really busy lives and things are going on and things can get crazy, but I just really want to challenge you to try to understand that you could be worshiping a golden calf and not know it. And the way to figure that out is to have friends come and support you and talk to you and, and point to God's word and challenge on the way you think. And I appreciate being challenged as well. You know, all of us can, can grow from each other. Now also, if you're not an online person, um, downstairs Josh will be there right now at a, a kiosk after the service, and he can help you um, consider different connection groups and ask, answer some questions about those as we strive to do this together. And this is, a, we will be following the pattern of following what's going on Sunday morning up till Thanksgiving. It's not very long. That's a short time to commit to something. Just try it. You know, just try it and see how it works. And I just, I can't ask you any stronger way than I can that get plugged in with a group. It's really, really important. My major spiritual growth over the years has come from my connecting with other people in groups from college age on than any sermons that I've heard, okay? So I want that same blessing for you. 
As we um, close, I want you to think about these questions. What ways are you learning the true nature of God? What are you doing now to make sure you're not worshiping a golden calf? And then also, if someone examined the words you pray, what would they say you thought about God? As you're praying this week, listen to yourself. Am I giving God a wish list like we would give Santa at Christmas time? Or am I praising the holy God of the universe? So think about those things. I will be up here as um, music is being played. If you have questions, thoughts about anything, you want me to pray with you about something going on in your life, I would love doing that. If you want to talk about what does it mean to be a, a member of our church family, that would be awesome. This is an opportunity for you to listen to the Holy Spirit. Um, please be open to that. My prayer for you is to have your heart soft and ready to make changes in your life so that you're not worshiping a golden calf. God, as we reflect right now, may we be really open and convicted because it is so easy to get derailed from worshiping you and start worshiping a more tame God, a God that is flannel graph Jesus, someone that is soft and fuzzy and warm and doesn't require much from us. But God, in you and your immense power and glory, help us to realize who you really are and who you call us to be as we have the opportunity to journey with you in your kingdom. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We invite you to stand with us as we sing the chorus to Blessed Assurance two times. And this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Yes, this is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Sing my Savior all the day long. Father, thank you for leading us and guiding us 
If we're worshiping a golden calf, show us. In your name we pray. Amen.